Continuing the story, after Laios's party successfully defeated the Red Dragon and met face to face with Farlin and the infamous, supposedly mad sorcerer of the dungeon, they are now faced with brand new challenges. Stay tuned as the story introduces us more adventurers who will join them on their increasingly complex quest. Encircled by spectral entities, Sinchi unsheathed his culinary knife. Chilchuk anticipated an imminent assault, however, the apparitions abruptly dissipated as if evaporating. Concerned for his mental state, he prompted Sinchi to rouse Laios for a reconnaissance of their surroundings. Upon venturing outside, Chilchuk was met with an unexpected encounter with orcs, eliciting a startled outcry. The orcs, enraged by the intrusion, detained them. Bewildered by the group's presence in their territory, particularly taken aback by the company of an elf. Their interrogation was halted by a female orc, identified as their captain, who sought clarity on the situation. Chilchuk disclosed their accidental arrival via a now-sealed entryway. The orcs categorized their captives, noting the diversity among them which included a deep dweller, a midget, long legs, and an elf. The captain expressed a morbid curiosity in executing the elf and proposed giving the dwarf to their hounds. Sinchi recognized the captain as the sibling of Chief Zahn, mentioning their mission to fulfill a vow made to the chief. Her astonishment was palpable upon hearing the chief's name. Upon closer inspection, the orcs realized Sinchi's identity as the vegetable vendor, attributing their initial failure to recognize him to his altered scent following a bath. The woman expressed her astonishment at their unexpected visit and inquired about the promise made to the chief. She also voiced her bewilderment at recent anomalies, such as the disappearance of the dragon, extending her gratitude on the chief's behalf. She subsequently commanded her subordinates to fetch their medical kit to attend to Laios, concocting an orsish decoction from an assortment of unidentified fruits and other components. Chilchuk expressed his repulsion at the concoction. He was taken aback when the captain consumed the concoction before administering it to Laios, a move Marcel found unbelievable. Marcel was approached next, and although she argued that her mana was merely depleted and she did not require the concoction, she discovered she was powerless to refuse. Chilchuk disclosed their encounter with an elven sorcerer, which caught the captain off guard. He described the assailant as a dark-skinned elf with silver hair, a description that the captain recognized. Although she admitted to limited information about the elf, she acknowledged the elf's long-standing presence in the dungeon, predating the orc settlement. The captain explained that the sorcerer assumed stewardship over the dungeon, emerging only when outsiders disrupted its balance. She created monsters to serve her will and had the capability to transform the dungeon's architecture at whim. The captain warned that the elf possessed the power to annihilate all life within the dungeon simply by opening her book. Chilchuk was astounded to realize they had encountered the infamous Mad Sorcerer. He speculated whether their confrontation was due to slaying the Red Dragon or possibly because Marcel had invoked it with her spell. They urgently needed to depart from the vicinity. The Sorcerer was known to command an array of monsters as servants, and eliminating one would invariably draw the Sorcerer's focus. The Orc Captain reflected on her brother's counsel against engaging the Red Dragon, advice that had consistently proven correct. Chilchuk expressed his annoyance over their lack of prior warning, anticipating that upon awakening, their companions would likely insist on resuming the search for Farland. They required a strategy to convince the pair to relinquish their quest. Suggested methods included potentially burning Marcel's staff, convincing them that since she was content having consumed dragon meat, or falsely claiming Farland was seen heading back to the surface. Since she questioned if deceit was their intended course of action, Chilchuk affirmed, deeming deception necessary to dissuade Laios and Marcel from delving deeper into the dungeon, a venture he believed would lead to their demise. He posed a rhetorical question to Sinchi about his willingness to meet his end within the dungeon walls, stating his own reluctance to follow them to such a fate. Sinchi was momentarily speechless. Approaching the orc captain, Chilchuk sought the retrieval of their equipment and requested assistance, which the captain rejected, fearing the spread of his cowardice. Sinchi stepped in, advocating for Chilchuk, acknowledging his fearfulness yet vouching for his good nature. Chilchuk was surprised by Sinchi's decision not to join him, with Sinchi explaining the necessity of someone remaining to look after Laios and Marcel. The captain, swayed by Sinchi's plea, agreed to assist. As Chilchuk lamented their collective folly, the captain inquired about a separated companion. 
Chilchuk acknowledged their last sighting of her was in a heap at the sorcerer's feet. However, the orc rebuffed, asserting that it wasn't a justification for betraying a fringe trust. Chilchuk retorted under his breath that it wasn't her concern, yet upon realizing she had overheard him, he quickly retracted, claiming he hadn't spoken. Suddenly, a spirit materialized behind him, its passage leaving him cold. The orc captain offered reassurance, clarifying that the spirit was one of the area's residents who maintained their sanity and manifested at will. The captain assured that the routes chosen by these spirits were secure, advising Chilchuk to follow their lead. Chilchuk recognized the area as familiar and indicated their point of descent, expressing confusion over the red dragon's disappearance. He speculated whether the dragon had been resurrected. However, observing the lack of vigilance among the dogs, the orc surmised that either the sorcerer had annihilated the dragon or had taken it elsewhere. Chilchuk recalled an explosion that occurred when Sinchi ignited a fire near the dragon's pouch, astonishing the orc with their unscathed survival. Chilchuk attributed their escape to a protective spell cast by a member of their group. He praised his companion's remarkable abilities but emphasized that was not his primary concern. Surprised by her own unforeseen use of powerful magic, he described Farlin as their healer who had bravely intervened just in time to shield them from the blaze. Although the crisis was averted, he regarded the action as a potentially perilous risk, reflecting on the characteristics of his allies. The captain queried their method for defeating the dragon. Chilchuk shared their tactic of distraction and lauded Lyoza's critical intervention, seizing the moment to mount and stab the dragon. The orc commended such valor, deeming it crucial for a warrior. Chilchuk, however, viewed it not as valor, but as a risky venture that, by chance, ended favorably, revealing his apprehension about Lyoza's decision-making. He also mentioned the departure of other party members, considering their decision prudent and pondered whether he should have also left. The orc's frustration was palpable upon hearing Chilchuk contemplate abandoning his comrades, which could lead to their demise. Chilchuk pondered whether his absence might have led to an earlier concession from the group. He further mentioned that, following the treatment of their injuries, they had retreated to that room, reminiscing about Sinchi's preparation of the Red Dragon. The orc recognized their entitlement to relish the spoils of their victory, inquiring if the sorcerer had manifested afterward and how they managed to endure. Chilchuk detailed how their mage adeptly countered the sorcerer's assault. The orc expressed disbelief that the elf, perceived as lacking in intellect, had confronted the sorcerer, noting her unassuming appearance did not suggest such courage. Chilchuk concurred, labeling the elf as somewhat simple-minded. He pointed out the elf's reliance on dubious magic and pondered the likelihood of a return to normalcy post-dungeon, assuming survival was possible. He added that they were all somewhat idiotic, critiquing their naive belief in overcoming the insurmountable through sheer will, a conviction he found impossible to challenge. The orc proposed the existence of alternative solutions, yet Chilchuk was prepared to resort to falsehoods if it meant ensuring their safe ascent from the dungeon depths, openly admitting his cowardice and self-preservation as his utmost concern. The orc then queried why Chilchuk wouldn't openly communicate his fears to his companions, voicing his desire to prevent their demise, a suggestion that momentarily dumbfounded Chilchuk. Subsequently, Chilchuk stumbled over Lyoza's sword, puzzled by its presence and deemed it the most rational of the group. Investigating the hallway, he discovered a sinister trail of blood, indicative of a dragged entity. Urged by the orc to hasten, lest he be left behind, Chilchuk relayed to his companions that their equipment had been recovered. Since she attempted to stop Lyos's immediate departure, and Chilchuk advised further rest. Lyos insisted on his well-being, attributing it to the administered medicine, yet he remained convinced of his sister's proximity. Chilchuk calmed him down and revealed he had an important announcement to make. Since she, however, cut in, mentioning he had already contemplated their situation. Chilchuk halted Senshi, stating he should be the one to speak first, arguing that Lyo's thoughts were predictable. Nonetheless, Chilchuk pointed out that continuing on their current path was untenable given they had reached their breaking point. Pushing further would inevitably lead to casualties. He argued that he must endure the absence of Farland for the time being and prioritize returning to the surface. He implored Lyo's, who clearly hadn't fully recovered, confessing his unwillingness to witness any more losses within their group. He expressed his concern for their well-being, 
suggesting that informing the governor about the sorcerer could provoke action. Alternatively, pooling their resources to hire assistants could be an option. With adequate preparation, their venture back into the depths could be more swift. Kneeling before Laios, Chilchuk earnestly requested they first make their way back to the surface. Sinchi chimed in, stating, quite candidly, that his culinary supplies were running low. He expressed his desire to cook a proper meal for Farlin upon reunion and proposed they return to town to replenish their supplies. The orc captain disclosed that she had already informed her brother of the Red Dragon's demise, anticipating his imminent return. She assured them that if they chose to resupply and return, the orcs would lend their support. Laios, initially hesitant, ultimately consented, apologizing for the concern he had caused. Their agreement was met with collective relief and satisfaction. Two days after deciding to head back to the surface, their journey was thwarted repeatedly by dead ends. Hunger, fatigue, and thirst plagued them all, as days of wandering left them lost. Chilchuk was astounded when a wall suddenly emerged, accompanied by tremors. Marcel clarified that these were not earthquakes but the dungeon itself shifting, likely manipulated by the sorcerer keeping tabs on them. Stunned by their circular path, Chilchuk proposed seeking an alternative route. Ascending the wall, he spotted a flying entity. Senshi used his pan for defense until it vanished. Senshi advised against climbing, suggesting they find a different path. Chilchuk noted an increase in the town's activity, to which Laios attributed the death of the Red Dragon, causing previously hidden monsters to roam freely. Normally, the area teemed with crawling monsters, their absence so far being a stroke of luck. Laios, visibly unwell and perspiring, received support from Chilchuk, while Sinchi criticized their relentless pace without rest or food since their separation from the orcs in the dragon encounter. He expressed concern for the human's well-being, particularly noting that Chilchuk and Marcel appeared to be in their growth phase. Regretting his inability to provide nutritious meals, Sinchi was eager to cook again. Despite having supplies from the orcs, he mourned the loss of his preserved dragon meat, Upon detecting the scent of flowers, Chilchuk deduced that blooming flowers indicated the proximity of a water source, prompting him to search for it eagerly. He followed the fragrance until he arrived at a peculiar area, which seemed to be a graveyard or something similar. He observed people there and encountered a group of women clustered together. Suddenly, Sinchi covered his eyes. They were noticed by the group, leading Sinchi to apologize for disturbing them. However, they swiftly attacked, surprising Sinchi. Laios intervened, pulling Sinchi to safety and engaged in combat using his sword. Upon striking, a strange substance emerged from the attacker's mouth. Laios then ordered the lowering of their weapons and disclosed that these beings were not humans but dried blossoms. Sinchi quickly deduced that the minuscule particles they inhaled were treated as poisoned by their bodies, prompting the immune system to aggressively eliminate the perceived threat. Overcome with emotion, his eyes teared up, followed by a sneeze, which was attributed to hay fever. Chilchuk, spared from direct exposure thanks to Sinchi, expressed disgust at their sneezing. The pain from inhaling dried pollen provoked abnormal reactions from Sinchi and Laios, while Chilchuk protected his nose. He observed they were still pursued by more dried blossoms, with Sinchi suffering immense pain and difficulty in breathing. When attacked again, Chilchuk managed to evade and sought assistance from his allies. Chilchuk's eyes started to hurt, so he requested Sinchi to swing his sword after counting to three. Their coordinated effort successfully hit one of the attackers, yet the air remained contaminated with lethal particles. With tears streaming down his face, Chilchuk realized their adversary had an opportunity to strike. Sinchi, despite being hit, continued to resist with his eyes closed. As the aggression persisted, Chilchuk suggested they flee, but Sinchi declined, determined to protect the younger members. Chilchuk was then asked to serve as Sinchi's eyes, although he admitted his vision was impaired. Sinchi advised using other senses instead. The overpowering pollen scent and Sinchi's heavy breathing rendered smell and sound unreliable, so Chilchuk resorted to detecting air movements. He noted the enemy's evasion of Sinchi's sneeze and subsequent repositioning behind them, directing his counterattack accordingly. This tactic resulted in the decapitation of the last dried blossom. Returning to Marcel, she noticed her staff was damaged and pointed out the urgency of its repair to prevent its demise, reflecting on the years dedicated to its growth. She was astonished by the condition of her companions, who insisted the area was secure, 
though she suspected deceit. Upon further inspection, she was astounded that they had combated the dryad blossoms. Since she, initially mistaking them for humans, learned from Laios that dryads are unisexual plants, possessing both male and female variants. This revelation sparked a new idea in him. The actions of his colleagues were marked by confusion as they observed his diligent search. Laios found immense joy in his discovery, though Marcel showed little to no enthusiasm. She perused the book for a spell to reverse time, yet Chilchuk intervened, advising against the pursuit of such perilous magic. Since she, meanwhile, fixated on the dryad's severed head, noted its failure to emit pollen upon being beheaded. Laios proposed it might represent a male flower, elaborating that unpollinated flowers typically safeguard their fruit. Chilchuk mistook something for fruit, but Laios corrected him, stating it was only a flower bud poised to evolve into a mature dryad flower. Given its appetizing appearance and presumed taste, they entertained the idea of harvesting it. Since she cautioned moderation in their harvest, a sentiment Laios echoed. They also discovered mandrakes sprouting in the vicinity. Marcel was playfully teased by Chilchuk by the lack of time to search for a dog, thus opting to sever its head instead. They stumbled upon mushrooms, satisfied with their gathered bounty. Having borrowed an axe from orcs, it was employed to split the dryad open. Ingredients were then simmered in a pot of water until tinder, mashed into a paste, added water, and seasoned. After inspecting the flower bud and being attracted by its scent, he sliced and sautéed it in butter, topped it with mushrooms and melted cheese. At last, the dish of sautéed dryad buds with cheese and jack o lantern potage was prepared. Marcel expressed her displeasure at his choice of serving bowl. Since she posited that the dish could aid in her mana restoration. Upon tasting the soup, Marcel was delighted by its sweetness and floral undertones, appreciating its thickness and richness. Chilchuk couldn't help but chuckle at her, whereas Laios sampled the dryad bud with cheese, enjoying its mildly bittersweet taste. Chilchuk abruptly questioned their strategy for exiting the area. Marcel posited the existence of a potential escape route. Chilchuk speculated on the presence of rules that might dictate changes in the dungeon's layout, recognizing this as a plausible notion. Lyo suggested they monitor the frequency of seismic events to discern a pattern. This approach sparked optimism among the group, with Sinchi appreciating the clarity of thought brought on by a satisfying meal. Marcel felt revitalized, convinced she had regained some of her mana, which she deemed necessary for healing the wounds of Lyo's and Sinchi. She received caution against pushing herself too hard. Marcel then announced her intention to instruct Laios in the use of magic, admitting her inability to single-handedly shield everyone from the mad sorcerer's threat. She reasoned that if Laios could master healing or protective spells, their collective strength would be enhanced. Despite having acquired basic magical knowledge from his sister, Marcel reassured him that, although their methods differed, the fundamental principles were similar. She committed to assisting him, recognizing the imperative for them to enhance their capabilities, which led to his acquiescence. As the duo embarked on their studies, Sinchi engaged Chilchuk in conversation. Chilchuk voiced his irritation at being perceived as juvenile by Sinchi and sought clarification on why Sinchi had shielded his eyes from the monsters. Through Sinchi's explanation, it became apparent that Chilchuk's father might have passed away. Sinchi proceeded to educate Chilchuk on the mechanics of life, likening human anatomy to the reproductive parts of flowers. Chilchuk was uncomfortable with Sinchi's detailed discussion on reproductive health, which included visual aids. Their dialogue continued into the evening. Mr. Tance and Adventurer Cabro were observed together. The gnome queried Cabro regarding his sensory control and any existing discomfort, to which Cabro indicated no adverse effects. The explanation provided highlighted the area's insufficiency in blood, necessitating the use of goat blood instead, hinting at the possibility of an imperfect outcome. They were advised to head back to town, noting their luck in being extracted from water, which otherwise could have resulted in their consumption by local fish. They deduced that the entity responsible for their rescue was the same one they suspected of stealing their valuables. Mr. Tance proceeded to request a revival fee, but decided to exclude the goat's cost. Cabra recollected their encounter with Merman, leading to another apparent demise. He questioned the gnome about their adventurer status, but the gnome was preoccupied with the financial transaction. Cabra's attempt to engage Namari was interrupted, and Mr. Tant summoned Namari while Lin playfully insinuated Cabra's attraction to dwarfs. 
Lyos humorously responded, stating his romantic choices were never influenced by height. They realized their provisions had been depleted, suspecting theft. The revelation sparked anger among them, with speculation about whether the thieves had spared their money. Lin, visibly irritated, promised retribution upon the thieves' discovery. The group sought Cabra's advice on their forthcoming actions. He resolved that their only option was to regroup in town, surprising those who assumed he aimed to let the culprits flee. Cabru rationalized their inability to advance without sustenance, confessing their lack of strength and echoing past advice that survival alone was a victory. This reflection prompted reconsideration among his peers. Accepting his decision, Home and Daya concurred with the plan. Lin conditioned her agreement on a promise from Cabro to continue their pursuit of the thieves, expressing her willingness to temporarily retreat. Kuro decided to align with Mikbel's decision. They collectively acknowledged the unpredictable nature of adventuring, including the potential for perilous situations. Cabra's attention to the surrounding mist prompted caution, with his assertion that the phenomenon was not of natural origin but likely the work of a monster. He was taken aback upon encountering mermen, who rapidly encircled them. With no alternatives, he unsheathed his sword ready for combat. Cabru recognized the familiar style of axe fighting and identified the swing, attempting to overpower the opponent without resorting to his sword, until both tumbled to the ground. He managed to pacify the creature, realizing it was Daya. He theorized that the mist was the result of an illusion spell, and deduced the inactive merman with a weapon was Kuro. Home, he surmised, might be the one frozen in place due to his tendency to become immobilized when overwhelmed. Mick was likely the one who fled, indicating Lin posed the greatest danger. His suspicion was confirmed when he observed her preparing a potent spell capable of annihilating everything. Believing that the most effective method to interrupt a mage's spell casting was a kiss, he informed Lin that they were merely illusions. Regrettably, she could perceive only his monstrous appearance. Faced with no other option, Cabru engaged them without his sword, merely aiming to incapacitate them, aware they were not the true adversary. The sole method to dispel the magical mist involved locating its caster, who he assumed would be unarmed and merely observing from nearby. Upon discovering the caster and approaching, the individual was astounded at being found out and conceded, restoring everyone to their original forms. Raising his hands, the caster requested their companion's release. Lin identified the individual as the corpse hunter previously seen on the upper levels. Their encounter seemed predestined, possibly because they had been tracked. When queried by a companion about the significance of this, he elucidated that deeper dungeon levels yield more corpses and thus, more lucrative rewards, as government subsidies support corpse hunting. Their preoccupation with retrieving their stolen possessions led them to a dungeon level they were ill-equipped to handle. By trailing them, the corpse hunters stood to profit from their potential demise. However, they arrived too late, as the group had been resurrected and was en route to the surface. Likely in a state of panic, they deployed an illusion spell in hopes of turning them against each other. The corpse hunter lamented that the optimal scenario would have involved capturing the thieves and ensuing mutual destruction among them. Unfortunately, they hadn't anticipated their swift demise at the hands of the monsters, which enraged Lin. Cabrera issued a stern warning, stating that engaging in combat and theft against fellow adventurers was a grave offense, and he intended to report this incident to the governor. The corpse hunter offered a proposition. He highlighted their considerable losses from this expedition and gestured towards two of their companions sprawled on the ground, suggesting that transporting these individuals to the resurrection center could yield a substantial reward. Cabrera corrected him, noting that they were merely unconscious, not deceased. The corpse hunter promised to back their claim that the mermen were to blame, in exchange for 40% of the earnings. Quickly adjusting his terms, he stated that even 30% would suffice, considering it a fair compromise, prompting Cabro to reflect on the offer. Ultimately, Cabro consented, despite the reservations of his team. He seized a long spear and advanced towards the man on the ground. Yet, rather than aiming at them, he directed the spear towards the negotiating corpse hunter. Home and Daya expected this since they felt it was what the corpse hunters deserved. Cabra's onslaught continued as he methodically slit the throats of the remaining corpse hunters, sparing only one. 
He commented on the simplicity of combating humans, observing that the vital points across humans, dwarves, and gnomes were consistently located and their movements were uniformly predictable. He expressed a wish for such simplicity when facing monsters. Cabro then tasked Kuro with locating Mick. His colleagues questioned the course of action regarding the remaining individual, who insisted on his non-involvement in his group schemes. Yet, he had not demonstrated any willingness to combat monsters or dispel the dungeon's curse. It appeared the number of people existing solely to exploit others was escalating. Inaction would drive away all upright individuals from the island, hence there was no inclination to forgive such behavior. Despite his pleas for mercy, Cabru finalized his fate and they discarded his body into the water. Cabru extended an apology to Lin for the impulsive act earlier, attributing it to the only conceivable solution at the moment. Lin, feigning unawareness, claimed ignorance of the incident he referenced. She concurred with Cabru's point that their relentless haste hindered true advancement, acknowledging their predicament resulted from their rushed decisions. Cabru proposed that Lin could at times uplift the group's spirits, to which she responded dismissively, arguing that mere words would not suffice, signaling they had reached their capabilities boundary. Cabru contemplated the governor's perception of the dungeon as a financial sinkhole, likely cognizant that the depletion of its treasures would pivot focus to monetizing monster remains. Absent the lure of treasure, adventurers would forego delving into its depths, potentially leading to a gradual depopulation of the area and leaving villagers vulnerable to monster attacks. This repetitive cycle had led to the desolation of numerous villages. The necessity to eradicate the dungeon's curse stemmed from the belief that the world had no need for either monsters or dungeons. Lin concurred with this rationale, abruptly shifting the topic to her hunger, a natural effect post-resurrection. Mick pointed out the valuable items in possession of the corpse hunters, presenting them to Cabru, who decided to salvage only their food, instructing the disposal of the remaining belongings into the water. Mick was perplexed by this directive, yet Cabru reasoned that to take their gear would lower them to the thieves' level. Following the disposal of the items, they agreed it was time to eat, reaching a consensus on this plan of action. They savored a well-prepared adventurer's portable meal set, which included salted meat, an assortment of nuts and dried fruits, bread, and wine. Their enjoyment of the flavorful provisions was unanimous. The lucrative nature of corpse hunting was acknowledged by Daya, highlighting the grim reality that they themselves eliminated adventurers before surfacing with the spoils. This led to speculation about the governor's awareness of such activities. Cabru mentioned that, although a review process for reward distribution is customary, these individuals seemed adept at navigating the system successfully on each occasion, possibly with the collusion of numerous other parties. As Home pointed out the system's apparent corruption, contemplating whether to alert the governor, Cabru expressed skepticism about any effective resolution emerging from such an action. Any steps taken might inadvertently place novice adventurers like Donnie at a disadvantage. Mick humorously wished for the governor's extreme corpulence, while Home considered the potential intervention of Elves should such an event occur. They concluded that, for the moment, it was prudent to allow the governor to act as a buffer against Elven interference. Cabru amused over a diverse party composition, mentioning a group that had provided them with spirit warts. Yet, to his companions, this group was merely viewed as pilferers of treasures and sustenance. Noting the scarcity of parties featuring an elf, Cabru surmised that narrowing their search could reveal the identity of the party in question. When a member suggested Finals group, Cabru doubted the likelihood of Donnie's team reaching the third level. He questioned the wisdom behind a four-member party configuration, deeming it a reckless choice. Lin raised a query about the spirit ward's peculiarities, only to realize he was still in possession of the item Cabro had identified as crucial evidence. Home admitted unfamiliarity with the specific magic involved. Upon examining it closely, Lin concluded that its creator was a perfectionist, given its textbook precision, a trait commonly associated with magic academy graduates, indicating the artisan was undoubtedly an elf. This revelation prompted Cabro to believe he had pieced together the puzzle. He merely speculated, yet if his suspicions proved accurate, his delight would be immense. He conjectured they were encountering the party associated with the Thornton siblings. Holm argued that their demeanor did not align with that of thieves, querying Cabru for any concrete evidence. Cabru mentioned the younger sister's Magic Academy graduation, 
Yet Holm highlighted that the spirit ward's creation was attributed to an elf. Cabrew reasoned that the elf closely affiliated with the younger Thornton might have shared educational paths with her, indicating a rare occurrence of an elf graduating from the Magic Academy, though this alone did not solidify their case. Holm noted they detected only one individual's scent, implying if the siblings were involved, it elucidated their willingness to venture into the dungeon with a minimal contingent. The absence of one sibling seemed evident, and internal discord on whether to return led to the departure of some members, including the individual they had recently encountered. The argument over objectives and remuneration could explain their theft of treasures and provisions. They also recalled a dwarf set. Assuming the previously seen dwarf had departed, they might have enlisted another. Lin inquired about their party's composition, and it was disclosed that it comprised Lyos and Farlin, the Easterner Soro, the recently encountered Namari, and the elf Marcel. Cabru theorized the halfling was named Chilchuk. Should his theory hold, it would mean the disappearance of one sibling alongside Soro and Namari, with a newcomer dwarf joining them. Daya acknowledged Namari as the esteemed weapon merchant's sole offspring, who once oversaw all weaponry on the island. His sudden disappearance following significant financial losses had subsequently soured the governor's perception of dwarfs. Daya reflected on the ramifications of the incident, finding it hard to envision a reputable dwarf in her stead. Kuro remarked on the distinct and menacing sin of the dwarf. Mick acknowledged his acquaintance with Chilchuk, who purported to represent the interests of all halflings on the island. Chilchuk had advised that any contract signings should be conducted through the guild, necessitating a mediation fee, leading Mick to denounce him as a profiteer. Opting not to join, Mick departed. He speculated their reaction upon discovering his employment of a cobalt. He then sought confirmation from Kuro about his willingness to work under him, to which Kuro responded affirmatively, praising Mick as a commendable employer. Home privately considered that Mick might be exploiting Kuro, failing to provide fair remuneration. Yet, Daya warned against levying accusations without tangible proof. The conversation shifted to the possibility of Lin's familiarity with the individual from the East. Lin countered, emphasizing the incorrectness of assuming uniformity among Easterners due to their diverse origins and languages. She noted that the name Soro was not commonly heard on their island and appeared to be more closely associated with Cabru than herself. Soro had arrived on the island alongside fellow countrymen, but he was the sole individual to join the Thornton party. His behavior was marked by an unusual drive to confront the dungeon's challenges as a test of his own capabilities. Cabru contemplated the reasons behind Soro's departure from the party, considering him unbothered by the prospect of inadequate rewards. It seemed plausible that it was the siblings who had gone missing, leaving Soro by himself, a conclusion Cabru found to be confusing and illogical. Mick was taken aback by Cabru's exceptional recollection, to which Cabru responded that it was merely a pastime, eliciting amusement from Lin who concurred on its apparent joyfulness. Cabru elaborated on the island's complexity, noting its inhabitants each pursued distinct objectives. He theorized that when these ambitions intersect, they could spark significant events that transformed the lives of many. Initially perceiving their predicament as mere victims of theft, he now sensed an intriguing development on the horizon, hopeful his suspicion regarding the involvement of the Thornton siblings' party was correct, eagerly awaiting the opportunity to reveal their authentic dispositions. Mick queried whether Cabru had previously encountered difficulties with him. Cabru indicated that although the siblings hadn't directly harmed him, their history involved substantial earnings from a gold-stripping group, all of which they altruistically donated to companions hindered from dungeon expeditions by physical ailments. This act was initially praised until Cabru disclosed a subsequent issue. Those beneficiaries, having recovered, persisted in accepting the funds without resuming their adventuring endeavors, opting instead to stay on the island and engage in black market activities. Cabru reminisced about the island's late esteemed ruler's proclamation that all would belong to the one who overcomes the dungeon's ruler, suggesting a later discussion on its veracity. He identified the dungeon as an ancient elven relic, endowed with immense power and influence, and argued that the Thornton siblings were unfit to govern it, criticizing them and the governor for their lack of integrity and disregard for others. Daya and Home acknowledged these concerns, affirming Cabra as the only suitable candidate to harness the dungeon's power and displace the incompetent governor. 
Mitt pointed out their current adversities with the dungeon's monsters indicated a long journey ahead. They pondered the consequences of reporting the theft, contemplating potential expulsion from the island. Consequently, they resolved to await in town, aiming to apprehend the thieves red-handed with the treasure. Preparing to depart, they hoped for an uneventful return to town, only to be ambushed by blade fish in the waters. Cabro advised maintaining focus on the underlying threats rather than the immediate distractions. A giant fish, initially mistaken for a kraken but later identified as a sea serpent, suddenly emerged, surprising the group. The tumultuous waters separated Lynn from her companions, and despite her attempt to cast a spell, she too was swept away by the strong currents. Cabru called out to home for assistance, only to be told that employing his abilities was not feasible due to the potential for mixing with other substances. Frustrated and at a loss, Cabru steadied himself, recognizing that the sea serpent's movements were not overly complicated. He knew he needed to bide his time for the perfect opportunity to strike at the creature's carotid artery, despite not knowing its exact location. At that critical moment, a woman unexpectedly perched on Cabru's shoulders, hurling an explosive into the sea serpent's mouth, causing a dramatic explosion. Next, Tate had successfully targeted the sea serpent. After her attack, she announced it was now their young master's turn to act. The young master unsheathed his sword and decapitated the sea creature with precision. The women converged on the individual who delivered the final blow, lauding his remarkable performance. They inquired if he had gotten dirty from the encounter and suggested dining there. However, he declined, stating their hurry to proceed, leaving the women lamenting his apparent deep infatuation with a woman from the north. Tade, meanwhile, mentioned her hunger and mused over the potential deliciousness of cooking the sea serpent's head. Home approached Cabro, concerned about any injuries. Cabro indicated a change in their plans and introduced himself to the group, expressing his gratitude for their intervention. The young master downplayed their gratitude, explaining they were simply passing by. Cabru hinted that the young master might be in search of a woman, capturing his interest. Cabru then posited that they might aid in locating Farland Thornton. Mick, perturbed by Kuro's fearsome appearance, voiced his concerns that it would intimidating for those present. However, the rest were unconcerned. During their magic training session, Marcel guided Laios in a technique that required him to touch his ear, leading to a moment of awkwardness that Marcel sharply reprimanded. Laios was cautious, not wanting his actions to seem inappropriate, prompting Marcel to take his hand and place it by her face, causing visible discomfort for Laios. Marcel emphasized the importance of overcoming shyness for effective magic casting, urging intense concentration. Since she remarked on Marcel's rigorous teaching method, Marcel instructed Laios to become attuned to the mana flowing within him, likening it to the circulation of blood. She advised allowing this energy to move from his palm towards her, synchronizing his breathing, body temperature, and pulse with this flow. Upon aligning these elements, Laios was to recite his spell as directed by Marcel. Following her guidance, Laios executed the technique, leading Marcel to suddenly release his hand, complaining of itchiness. Concerned, Laios inquired about her well-being. Marcel, noticing a scab had detached, commended Laios's execution, despite the discomfort it caused her. She reassured him that such reactions were typical at the onset of learning this magic, praising his swift understanding and suggesting a natural aptitude for magic within their lineage. Laios expressed gratitude to Marcel for her effective teaching, contrasting it with his inability to grasp these concepts when explained by his sister, Farlin. Marcel noted Farlin's instinctual approach to magic, recommending Laios now attempt the technique on Sinchi. They prepared Sinchi on a table, with Marcel observing. Simultaneously, Marcel attended to her damaged staff, planning to mend it with dryad branches as a provisional solution, hopeful for its acceptance. During their magical training session, Laios and Sinchi experienced a bit of awkwardness. Sinchi expressed discomfort with Laios's manner of touching, prompting Farlin to admonish Laios to proceed without hesitation. Chilchuk observed that healers inevitably spend considerable time in physical contact with others, which can spawn a range of complications. According to him, interpersonal issues, such as romantic entanglements and ensuing jealousy, are the most frequent causes of party dissolution. When Marcel questioned if Chilchuk was alluding to Farlin and Soro, Chilchuk clarified his statement was based on personal experience, 
stressing that leadership requires more than physical strength, it demands the ability to unify the group. He suggested that Lyos should prioritize learning diplomatic skills and better character judgment over teaching magic to prevent their involvement in dark arts rituals. Marcel, questioning why Chilchuk himself wouldn't learn magic, heard his response that many halflings who encountered dark arts artifacts were abducted and never seen again, leading him to sarcastically apologize for his ignorance due to lack of magical education. Marcel elucidated that the ancient magic she studies allows for the transfer of energy from an alternate dimension filled with boundless energy into their world. She compared the conversion of water to gas to the challenge of transforming an entire lake into gas, emphasizing that achieving such a feat requires spellcasting assistance to meet the necessary energy and time demands. This is where coordinate magic comes into play, as several dungeon areas connect to the alternate dimension facilitating monster summons and the dungeon's formation itself. They found Farlin depleted of strength, compelling Marcel to alter a segment of the dungeon to temporarily integrate her body into its structure. Amid her explanation, another tremor shook the ground, causing wall movement. Marcel suggested a closer inspection, but Lyo succumbed to likely mana sickness from his inaugural magic use and collapsed. Marcel reassured that he would recover, but they left him to rest momentarily. Lyos was grappling with an intense malaise, accompanied by seemingly hallucinatory whispers. The group, with Marcel's notice, observed that their current pathway was undergoing alterations. Chilchuk voiced his lack of clarity regarding the dungeon's operational mechanics, prompting Senshi to propose a period of observation. Suddenly, the ground beneath them elevated, compelling Chilchuk to direct an immediate evacuation from the spot, narrowly evading entrapment. Unbeknownst to them, a formidable adversary, a cockatrice known for its venomous nature, had stealthily approached them from behind. Recognizing the imminent danger, the trio initiated a swift escape. Senshi likened the adversary to a basilisk, a comparison Chilchuk agreed with, cautioning against the creature's petrifying bite. The group sought refuge through a door on their left, hastily securing it behind them. However, the cockatrice's keen senses remained on their trail, threatening the door's durability. Since she remarked on the creature's potential ability to detect their body heat, complicating their escape strategy. Since she asked Marcel to recall their strategy against a basilisk, spurred by his encouragement for Marcel to confront the beast by making herself appear larger and emitting a powerful shout. Marcel doubted her capacity to intimidate the creature, considering an explosion spell as an alternative, despite challenging positioning. Contemplating the futility of simply emerging and shouting, Marcel questioned the strategy's effectiveness against the snake-like head. Opting for a personal approach, she prepared to engage the cockatrice, declaring her status as the Magic Academy's most distinguished student while initiating an explosion spell. Sinchi and Chilchuk, recognizing the origin of the blast, emerged to assist. Sinchi's subsequent axe strike aimed at the cockatrice's head was insufficiently deep. As the creature focused on Marcel, she executed another spell, creating an opportunity for Senshi to deliver a decisive blow. But she was bit by the snake head. Their collaborative effort ultimately subdued the beast. Chilchuk inquired about Marcel's condition, to which she confirmed her well-being. Senshi then transported her back to Lyos, apologizing for her perceived heaviness, which Senshi humorously speculated could lead to his crushing. Lyos, now alert, expressed concern upon learning of Marcel's encounter with the cockatrice. He suggested a peculiar method for addressing the bite, which Marcel initially believed to be a serious remedy, only to find herself turning to stone amidst her frustration. The precarious position she was in posed a risk of limb detachment, heightening Lyos's concern for her stability. Faced with uncertainty on how to proceed, Lyos pondered a cure for her condition. One approach could involve allowing the condition to naturally dissipate, treating it akin to a curse rather than a toxin. Elves, possessing a heightened resistance to magic, might experience a swifter recovery. Alternatively, they could seek out medicinal herbs or locate another group of adventurers equipped for curing. The ultimate strategy might entail Lyos personally casting a curative spell. Chilchuk queried the feasibility of such an endeavor. Lyos, having been instructed in the fundamental knowledge required to decipher a magical tome by Marcel, believed a spell to reverse petrification could be found within its pages. Chilchuk proposed they could also explore for herbs or other adventurers while determining which approach would prove effective. 
Lyos disclosed that for humans, natural recovery could span from six months to a decade. Senshi then retrieved the cockatrice, while he and Lyos engaged in intensive study. Senshi decided to pickle the discolored dryad butts. Chilchuk, concerned Marcel might fall, especially in the event of another quake, suggested placing something beneath her for support. Senshi proposed a more ingenious solution. Mixing the dried buds with seasoning and covering it with a lid, they placed the petrified Marcel on top. After immersing the cockatrice meat in brine, Senshi strategically placed it on Marcel's lap to ensure her stability. After three days of experimenting, Lyos initiated a spell on the fourth day. Surprised when vegetables dropped from Marcel's face, he adeptly caught her as she descended, marking her return to her original state and culminating their joyous relief. Marcel, puzzled by her vegetal adornment and the pot in her possession, listened as Sinchi reviewed the pickles, pronouncing the experiment a success. He then prepared the meat, thinly slicing it and serving it alongside fermented dryad buds, presenting Eisbein-style cockatrice and dryad bud sauerkraut with a grilled anti-petrify herb side dish. Marcel expressed astonishment at the duration of her petrification despite her resistance spell. The group speculated on the cure's source, attributing it to their respective contributions, Lyos to his incantation, Chilchuk to his herbs, and Sinchi to the cockatrice meat's antagonistic effect. Marcel, acknowledging the inconvenience she caused, was poised to apologize but emphasized the inadvisability of using a person as a pickle press, visibly annoyed. Chilchuk disclosed that while they were preoccupied with petrification, bleeding noses, and foraging for food, he had managed to unravel some principles regarding the dungeon-shifting nature. The group protested, noting their experiences weren't by choice, yet acknowledged the past three days had been productive. Chilchuk explained that should a pathway be sealed, an alternative invariably emerges, perpetuating this cycle without affecting the total count of doorways, furnishings, or the architectural essence a residence, for example, wouldn't turn into a graveyard. He highlighted a peculiar pattern where if a house boasted seven restrooms, it implied that six were devoid of lavatories. He further observed that the walls perpetually rotated in a clockwise spiral, whereas statuary remained fixed but could pivot directionally, leading them through his observations, impressing them with his insights, even earning the title of a genius. However, a shift in Marcel's demeanor was noticeable upon the realization they were traversing the very street where they had lost Farlin. Chilchuk anticipated that any remnant of blood might rekindle Marcel and Lyos's determination to locate her, prompting him to consider ways to calm them. This area resonated differently with them, with Chilchuk himself expressing surprise at its transformation. The dragon's remains had vanished, and the area had been cleared. Senshi remarked on the whole present when they defeated the Red Dragon. Upon inspection by Lyos, a spirit emerged, warning of the sorcerer's eye's imminent arrival, startling him into retreat. He speculated it might be a result of the mana's sickness, causing him to hallucinate since his collapse. Marcel doubted it was merely mana's sickness and inquired about what he heard. After Lyos repeated the spirit's warning, Marcel recognized it as a threat, and they heard an approaching dragon. With nowhere to hide on the street, Marcel suggested concealment within the walls, pushing them in. Astonished at their ability to enter, they wondered about their location and how it occurred, suspecting magic as the cause, just as the dragon passed by their hiding spot. Upon their exit through the wall, which now had an opening, Chilchuk queried about the specific type of magic utilized. Lyos deduced that they were dealing with dungeon cleaners, the entities tasked with the upkeep and sanitation of dungeon areas. Marcel confirmed his suspicion, noting that the wall had not fully solidified yet. Lyos examined the wall, discerning the sections between the original construction and the areas mended, noting even the flooring had undergone meticulous repairs. The precision in restoring it to its initial state was such that discerning the differences was nearly impossible. Observing the ground, Chilchuk recoiled at the sight of minute organisms and debris, identified by Lyos as cleaners, not classified as monsters and essentially harmless, although Sinchi contested this. Citing the damage they had done to his tent by disassembling what they perceived as obstructions, it appeared their purpose was to consume leftovers from the dragon and debris resulting from an explosion. When the dungeon sustains damage, such as from an explosion, cleaners secrete a substance to halt the spread of fire and prevent the collapse of additional structures. 
indiscriminately devouring any matter in their path and filling in damaged areas with their secretions, thus returning the affected sections to their original look. Marcel added that this process mirrored the self-healing mechanism in living organisms, suggesting the monsters roaming the dungeon acted like an immune system, clearing out germs, prompting Chilchuk to wonder who she deemed germs. Since she expressed astonishment at the entire operation being magically orchestrated, jestingly inquiring about the existence of a magical digestive system next. Lyos chuckled, musing on the dungeon's diet. With the dragon's blood traces erased, Chilchuk experienced relief and encouraged the group to move on before another alteration in the dungeon's configuration. At last, reaching the staircase brought Marcel joy, while Chilchuk noted their forthcoming departure. However, since she indicated they had one more task before leaving. Misinterpretations of his statement were clarified when he suggested they needed to refuel with food for the stair climb. Chilchuk playfully jabbed at Marcel's preference for donning a frog suit. Faced with an abundance of ingredients, since she deliberated on his culinary choice, eventually opting to cook barley sourced from the third floor, reserved as a rice substitute. He proceeded to use ground cockatrice meat, dried fruits, and chopped anti-petrification herbs, seasoning them before pan-frying. Placing barley at the base of a brick, he layered the ingredients and applied heat. An egg from the cockatrice was broken over the concoction, with its sauce drizzled on top, completing the cockatrice and egg and cake dish. Lyos was intrigued and eager to taste it, while Marcel mused whether she might have been utilized in the recipe had she not been cured. The charred barley at the bottom was particularly relished by them. Since she introduced Lyos to a stone dish, crafted from bricks created by dungeon cleaners, eliciting discomfort from Marcel and Chilchuk at the thought. Yet, Lyos was keen to sample it. He described its taste as initially mud-like, transitioning to nuances of cabbage worm, steel, and lemons, a mixture of flavors difficult to articulate. Chilchuk raised concerns over consuming magical entities. Marcel humorously suggested Lyos might experience nosebleeds and auditory hallucinations, sparking his interest. They recommended he consult a physician upon their return to town, surprising Lyos who was then startled by an emerging creature. A monster appeared behind him, prompting him to question its reality. Confirming its presence, they realized an ambush, as they were seized by women examining them for potential shape-shifting capabilities. One proposed revealing their true forms through lethal means, but someone intervened, recognizing them and unveiling Soro's presence. Lyos, pleased by the reunion, observed Soro's slimmed appearance. Soro then freed Lyos, who expressed his gratitude and introduced Sinchi, commending his strength. Lyos invited them to dine, extending hospitality to his group and observing their enlarged assembly. Lin recognized them, realizing they had found the party they were searching for. Kabro courteously introduced himself. When asked if he was Lyos, he affirmed, expressing pleasure in meeting them. While Lyos engaged in conversation with Soro, Cabra observed from afar. Lin queried what actions they intended to take, given the previous incidents of theft. After some thought, Cabra concluded that they would not pursue any actions. Lin expressed frustration, questioning the purpose of their descent if no actions were to be taken. Cabra responded, saying he simply wanted to meet them. He doubted any confrontation regarding the treasure would yield results since their initial meeting did not reveal any guilt. The treasure might have been forgotten, a misunderstanding on their part, a trap, or a combination thereof. Lin, not satisfied, asked if they had merely wasted their time. Cabra reassured her to give it a moment, suggesting his aim was to understand how they arrived there and their forthcoming plans. Lyos inquired if Soro's party had been on that floor for an extended period. Soro confirmed, mentioning their circular routes and eventual return to the entrance. Lyos revealed they too had been lost, but credited Chilchuk with deciphering the dungeon's mechanics, allowing them to reach their current location. Chilchuk questioned Soro about the women, jesting about their relation, which Soro clarified as his retainers, selected for their prowess as warriors. Soro apologized for leaving their group, explaining his return to the dungeon in search of Farlan upon discovering she was not on the surface. Lyos reassured him, but Soro was surprised at their prompt return to the dungeon. Soro reflected on whether their decision was overly precipitous, astonished upon hearing from Marcel about their triumph over the Red Dragon. Grasping Lyos, Soro eagerly inquired about Farlan's fate, only to weaken and collapse. 
His companions urged him to rest and eat, highlighting the body's limitations. Laios concurred, emphasizing the necessity of rest and sustenance for achieving objectives. He promised to recount their adventures while Soro dined. Soro hesitantly agreed, requesting Maizuru to commence meal preparation, who joyfully obliged, eager to cook. Tate was delegated to collect water, Hien and Benikadori to prepare rice, and asked to be to safeguard their young master. Senshi offered to kindle the fire, pleasing Maizuru. Laios noted their group's size was impractically large for their current setting, posing a risk of attracting unwanted attention from dungeon dwellers. He proposed dividing into three smaller units to minimize this threat. Maizuru inquired about Lin's and the other's capability to wield magic, assigning them the task of constructing a magical barrier to fend off any encroaching monsters while Soro ate. Laios, with Kabru's assistance, took Soro aside to recount their recent adventures. As everyone dispersed to their assigned duties, Chilchik deliberated over who would be most susceptible if left to their own devices, ultimately deciding to accompany Senshi. With Asabi keeping watch, Laios and Kabru supported Soro. Meanwhile, Lin's team busied themselves with the barrier's construction, and Maizuru collaborated with Senshi on meal preparation. Chilchik, noticing the excessive smoke, learned from Maizuru that it was part of the post-dining regimen for their young master, including a bath and grooming. Laios briefed Soro on their harrowing experiences after departing with Namari, their victory over the Red Dragon, Farland's rescue and revival, followed by an ambush by the mad sorcerer that led to their separation. Their attempt to seek help on the surface was thwarted by disorientation, culminating in their encounter with Soro's group. Laios sought Soro's assistance in their ongoing endeavors. Cabra, skeptical about their identification of the attacker as the mad sorcerer, voiced his doubts, given the scarcity of survivors from such encounters. Laios attributed their narrow escape to Marcel's ingenuity, carefully omitting the use of dark arts, under the guise of ignorance regarding the specifics of Marcel's spell work. Cabra, sensing Laios's reticence, suspected he was withholding information. Soro's curiosity was piqued by Laios's unconventional snack, leading to a revelation that it was a piece of wall, reconstructed by dungeon cleaners after they had exhausted their supplies in the haste to re-enter the dungeon. This disclosure startled Soro, while Cabru whimsically queried about the most palatable monster Laios had consumed. Laios enumerated his culinary experiences in the dungeon, with the red dragon topping his list shocking Soro with the fact they consumed the dragon that had devoured his sibling. Cabra's interest in the edible aspects of living armor prompted Laios to describe its composition, showcasing his sword kin Suku, now a target of the cleaner's consumption. Laios offered to treat them to a taste next time, if interested. Returning to the subject of Farlin, Soro inquired about her condition at the time of their separation and whether Laios had any clue regarding her whereabouts. He noted the floor they were on had many hiding spots but had become an orc stronghold. Laios reassured him there was no longer a need to worry about the orcs, surprising Cabru who thought they might have been enemies. Laios clarified that much had transpired, and they were now collaborating with the orcs, a notion that puzzled Cabru given that adventurers were typically tasked with eliminating orcs. Laios speculated that the mad sorcerer had abducted Farlin, possibly taking her to a deeper level of the dungeon. Soro's expression changed upon hearing this, suggesting he was open to discussing it further, so he requested privacy from Cabru, who exited with Asabi. Once alone, Soro began to share about Farlin's condition and the measures needed for her revival but was interrupted as the scene shifted to Maizuru preparing a meal. Maizuru commented that military rations weren't inherently bad, but a warm meal was often what the stomach required, a sentiment Sinchi agreed with. Maizuru shared that the young master had been frail since childhood, seldom eating much, which concerned everyone. However, she noted the young master only ate well when she prepared the meals. Describing Soro as obedient and reasonable, Maizuru expressed occasional worries about him, recalling a rare favor when Soro knelt to ask for help in rescuing someone, highlighting how a woman from the north had captivated the young master's heart. Maizuru pondered what could be said to persuade Soro to relinquish his search for Farland, leaving Sinchi taken aback. Since she learned that Maizuru had been appointed by the current head of the household to care for Soro. When asked why she went to the effort of cooking for him, since she mentioned Soro appreciated his meals because they were made with love, a comment that made Maizuru blush at the compliment. 
The meal Maizuru had meticulously prepared was finally ready to be served. Eager to present the dish to Soro while it remained hot, she was taken aback to see Kabru outside, who informed her that Layos and Soro were engaged in a private discussion. Undeterred, Maizuru and Sinchi entered, only to be met with a shocking scene. Soro was aggressively choking Layos, causing Maizuru to inadvertently drop the food she was carrying. Soro's evident rage piqued Maizuru's curiosity about the unfolding situation. Despite inquiring with those outside, Kabru professed ignorance of the circumstances. Astonishingly, Asabi had managed to overhear the entire exchange from her position outside. She disclosed that dark arts and monstrous flesh were utilized to resurrect Farland, a revelation that stunned everyone present. Soro was disbelieving, aware that any association with dark arts, no matter the rationale or degree of involvement, rendered one a criminal destined for a dim dungeon cell to decay. The implications of the elves discovering their actions were dire and unfathomable. Lyos argued that such a grim fate would be avoidable only if the matter remained secret, hopeful that Soro would keep the information confidential. In a fit of fury, Soro unsheathed his sword, pointing it directly at Lyos, who insisted they were left with no alternative and appealed for Soro's understanding. Kabru, intrigued by the mention of dark arts, anticipated the unfolding drama with a mix of excitement and apprehension, contemplating his involvement yet wary of potential peril. In a distant view, the significant smoke emanating from their location caught Farland's attention as she continued to mutter King Durgal's name. Struggling across the ground, she declared her imperative need to locate the king. The tension escalated significantly between Lyos and Soro, with Kabur stepping in to mediate. He questioned whether the use of dark arts for Farland's resurrection was worth it, provoking sharp reactions from both men. Kabur pointed out Soro's understandable dismay, noting the high risks associated with dark magic and suggesting it might have been better to let Farlin pass away naturally. Soro, expressing understanding for Cabru's point, asked to cease the discussion, prompting an apology from Cabru. He conceded that, placed in a similar dilemma, Soro might have opted for the challenging decision as well. Soro criticized Lyos's approach, doubting his ability to comprehend Lyos's mindset, which he believed made cooperation impossible. Chilchuk then interrupted with urgent news, a monstrous attack had disrupted their cooking efforts. The solemn mood surprised Chilchuk, especially after learning Lyos had disclosed their entire ordeal to Soro. Astonished by Lyos's admission, Chilchuk criticized the decision to confide in Soro, labeling him as the least appropriate recipient of such sensitive information. Lyos, regretting his judgment, feared the repercussions of his mistake. Kabru attempted to alleviate the mood, suggesting Soro's anger stemmed from exhaustion. Lyo shared his profound respect for Soro, reflecting on the countless instances Soro had aided their quests. He acknowledged Soro as his mentor in understanding the broader world outside his homeland and the island, always appreciating Soro's wisdom and composure. Lyo's admitted his mistake had deeply offended Soro, lamenting the potential end of their companionship. As they confronted the aerial assault by creatures known as harpies, each member of their party engaged in combat, finding the harpy's agility a challenge for a direct defeat. Maizuru called for assistance from his allies, delegating the task of handling these swift adversaries. Marcel observed a noticeable distance between Soro and Lyos, a situation Chilchik attributed to Lyos having disclosed their entire ordeal to Soro, resulting in strained interactions between them. Chilchik voiced concerns about the repercussions of their actions becoming known on the surface. Their discussion was abruptly interrupted by a harpy plummeting into their midst, demonstrating the ninja's efficiency in dealing with these monsters without apparent difficulty. Marcel wondered if others were privy to their secret, to which Chilchik confirmed that four individuals were in the know. Soro, two of his companions, and a man with curly hair recognized by Marcel as part of a group previously vanquished by treasure bugs. Curiosity arose regarding their presence in the dungeon, leading to speculation they were investigating the theft of their provisions and treasure. Marcel considered clarifying the misunderstanding about the treasure bugs and the inevitable spoilage of their submerged food, but Chilchuk hesitated to openly acknowledge their theft, suggesting a wait-and-see approach due to the lack of concrete evidence against them. The group's main concern was their utilization of dark arts. Despite Soro's anger, Chilchik believed it wouldn't pose a significant issue, 
attributing his reaction to Farland's endangered state. Chilchuck pondered over potential evidence of their dark arts usage, but Marcel noted the dungeon cleaners have erased the magic circle. However, the investigation of Farland's body or her staff could lead to suspicion. Chilchuck proposed destroying the staff as a precautionary measure, but Marcel argued it might already be too late if suspicions had been aroused. The group was taken aback when one of Soro's female companions fell from above. Mick identified the attacker perched on the rooftop, prompting Chilchik and Marcel to wonder about the monster's nature, soon realizing it was not a harpy. Their astonishment intensified upon discovering the being clutching another comrade was Farlin. The revelation shocked everyone, including Soro, leaving them struggling to accept Farlin's metamorphosis into an unusual entity equipped with wings, feathers, and scales. As Farlin released another captive, Cabru prepped the team for confrontation. Marcel endeavored to communicate with Farlin, inquiring if she remembered her, while Chilchik asked Laios and Soro to determine their course of action. Soro directed his ally Inyutade to subdue Farlin without inflicting harm, a command Inyutade found challenging. The tension escalated when Maizuru was apprehended and murdered by the adversary, compelling Kuro and Daya to attack Farlin with their weapons. Kuro's bite and Daya's aim at her limbs inflicted pain on Farlin, eliciting a scream. Tade, conflicted over adhering to Soro's command to apprehend Farlin harmlessly. As Laios asked Soro to duck for safety, Farlin swung her tail, striking Tade and propelling her into the wall. Cabril inquired about Holm's combat readiness, to which Holm responded by manifesting a liquid. Daya faced difficulty, and Farlin's reaction to choke him attracted her focus. A bubble explosion captivated Farlin's gaze, identified by Marcel as an Undine's work. Marcel queried home on his dominion over the Undine and implored him to desist, positing that Farlin was merely disoriented. Cabru, however, voiced concerns over the perilous predicament, reflecting on the numerous sacrifices made to safeguard someone dear, contending the figure before them was not Farlin but a monster. In a moment of fury, Farlin unleashed a spell to destroy the Undine, leading home to shed tears as Marilir fell in defeat. Cabral was taken aback to see that Farlin could also cast spells. Farlin's next target was Kuro, who had been biting her. She forcefully pulled him away, and upon being bitten on her hand, she crushed him underfoot, ending his life. This saddened Mike, who had been merely observing from a distance and was concealed by Chilchik for safety. Cabru then placed his trust in Lin to bring the situation under control. Lados confronted his sister, calling out her name in an attempt to reach her. However, Lin intervened, launching an attack that forced Lados away. She unleashed a potent spell that knocked Farlin to the ground. This action reminded Lados of a prior discussion with Sinchi about the inherent dangers of monsters. He expressed frustration with his sword, lamenting that in the end, it was still a creature of monstrosity. Ken Suka vibrated in response to the unfolding events. Lados made a heartfelt plea to his sister, wishing he could replace her if it were possible. Through his tears, she looked at Laios and affectionately called him brother, surprising him. As she attempted to rise, a hand emerged behind her, belonging to Cabru, who proceeded to slit her neck, leaving both Laios and Soro in shock. In a moment of desperation, Cabru inflicted stabs to Farlin's lung, kidney, and heart. Despite these grievous wounds, Farlin summoned the strength to grasp and fling Cabru to the ground. Locked in Farlin's glare, Cabru recognized the imminence of his demise. Laios, seizing the moment, plunged his blade into Farlin's foot, eliciting a scream from her while he tended to Cabru, offering apologies for his moment of indecision. He conceded that Cabru's assessment was accurate. His sister likely remained under the dungeon master's influence. Eliminating her could inadvertently summon the mad sorcerer once more. Their immediate course of action, Laios determined, was to make their escape. Yet, Farlin's foot activated once more, ensnaring Cabra and ending his life. Laios was subsequently thrown aside. Farlin shed her garments, unveiling her monstrous form. Lin was enraged as Farlin conjured a spell. Marcel identified it and summoned her companions to her side for protection. The spell generated lethal thorns from the ground. While Home managed to evade, Marcel shielded her group, although Lin was struck. From afar, Laios observed as Farlin retreated, leaping onto the rooftop and vanishing from sight. Those who remained were stunned by the turn of events. Laios directed Marcel to transport the wounded to the barrier, 
and Holm volunteered for the resurrection task, cautioning that not all could be brought back to life. He stressed the importance of conserving every drop of blood from the bodies for the resurrection process. Despite his dizziness, Holm embarked on reviving their allies, beginning with Cabru. Upon awakening, Cabru's first concern was the whereabouts of the monster, to which Holm assured him the danger had passed. Cabru then insisted Holm revive Maizuru next. Cabru revealed his observation of Maizuru's potential as a mage capable of healing or even resurrecting others, acknowledging Holm's limitations in reviving everyone. He argued that it wasn't excessive to request this favor, given Maizuru's significant contributions to their group. Maizuru, feeling indebted, speculated that Cabru might be seeking a particular spell. The urgency of reviving their companions before the depletion of their blood was palpable. Marcel offered her capabilities to cast a rudimentary resurrection spell, yet she was promptly forbidden by the group, particularly Soro, from engaging in further dark magic. Soro's visible irritation led to his questioning of Farland's transformation, attributing it to Marcel's use of dragon flesh and dark arts. Marcel disputed this, asserting the impossibility of her spell causing such changes. Nonetheless, she hypothesized the existence of a spell within the dragon's soul that might have merged Farland's soul with the dragons, altered by the mad sorcerer's influence. Soro resolved to deliver Marcel to the elves in the west, unable to slay the monstrous version of Farland, but also refusing to let her flee. His desire was to liberate Farland's soul from the dungeon, ensuring her peace, with a belief that the elves could facilitate this. He planned to accompany her and confess all that had occurred. Lottos interjected, suggesting an alternative approach, which only served to infuriate Soro more. Soro derided Lyos's lack of a viable solution, ridiculing the idea of endless resurrections with monster flesh until Farland's restoration. He demanded Lyos to articulate a plan, leaving everyone speechless. Lyos asserted their objective to defeat the Mad Sorcerer, believed to be controlling the Red Dragon and Farland. By vanquishing the Sorcerer and nullifying its commands, they hoped to resolve their dilemma. Despite uncertainty on the precise methodology, Lanos expressed confidence in Marcel's capability to achieve their aim. Nonetheless, Soro stated it was sufficient. Was she genuinely contemplating resolving the issue they had originally caused with dark arts by employing the same? Out of the blue, Lanos gave him a slap, astonishing onlookers. Lanos immediately expressed regret, yet Soro struck back with a punch to Lanos's face. In defense, Lyos reciprocated, knocking Soro to the ground. Lyos admitted his inferior skills and acknowledged Soro's superior strength over most adventurers. However, he was confident about one aspect. Their consistent routine of consuming three meals daily and getting adequate rest underscored their dedication more than Soro's. Lyos confronted him, affirming their ability to defeat the mad sorcerer and rescue his sibling. He suggested Soro retreat to the surface for sustenance, cleansing, and rest. Soro's response was initially incomprehensible to Lyos until he realized Soro had uttered, shut up, followed by delivering an uppercut that sent Lyos tumbling down, indicating their confrontation wasn't concluded. Taken aback by another strike, Soro disclosed his long-suppressed frustration towards Lyos, attributing it to Lyos's obliviousness and unintentionally awkward nature, which he found exceedingly irritating. Lyos pushed back, inquiring why Soro had withheld his feelings until now. Soro countered that his demeanor and responses should have been indicative, challenging Lyos to employ his intellect for discernment. Lyos retorted, perplexed about how he could have been aware, cherishing the friendship formed on the island. Their exchange intensified, with Soro critiquing Lyos's genuineness, prompting others to question the appropriateness of the timing for their dispute. Maizuru felt remorseful for not adequately guiding Soro. Eight had perished, including herself, during the conflict, with one injured and three missing. She, along with the gnome home, were tasked with resurrecting the deceased, but the available blood was insufficient. She sought assistance in gathering food, whereas Marcel's offer to help was accepted with restrictions to healing the injured or locating the missing. Maizuru vowed to vigilantly watch over her for any dubious spells, promising severe consequences without hesitation if any were detected. Marcel embarked on a mission to locate their companions, initially finding Tade concealed behind a wall. Subsequently, Chilchik and Mick were discovered taking refuge in Sinchi's cooking pot. During her search, Sinchi stumbled upon a harpy, while Holmes successfully revived Daya. 
Cabru provided comfort to Lin amidst the ongoing chaos. Concurrently, the quarrel between the two friends persisted, their faces marked with bruises yet unwavering in their dispute. Eventually, Soro succumbed to exhaustion, attributed to his hunger, which further agitated him. Senshi promptly presented him with food, which Soro accepted even while prostrate, finding solace in the meal as he rested. Maizuru reported the successful resurrection of those who had perished, prompting a discussion on their subsequent actions. He proposed initiating the return spell for their journey back to the surface, despite concerns over Asabi's whereabouts, who was presumed to have fled. Apologies were offered by the rest for not being sufficiently strong to offer aid, yet Soro expressed gratitude for their valiant efforts and apologized for compelling their involvement. His unexpected appreciation moved his companions to tears. Soro announced his decision to return to his homeland, vowing never to revisit the island, and to alert the governor about the incidents, a plan that Lyos accepted. Soro expressed a desire to have returned with Farlin at his side. Lyos queried about Farlin's response to his proposal, with Soro confessing his uncertainty as she had sought time to deliberate. He fondly recollected moments shared, notably Farlin's fascination with a caterpillar on her finger, a reaction diverging from most women's aversion, revealing his recognition of his love for her. He treasured every facet of Farlin, her voice, intellect, smile, lamenting his failure to confess his sentiments earlier. Lyos volunteered to communicate Soro's feelings, highlighting Soro's envy of Lyos's candor. Lyos turned to Cabru, acknowledging a debt of gratitude for the rescue. Cabru downplayed his contribution, noting his actions barely impeded the beast. Lyos, however, emphasized the educational value of Cabru's assault tactics. The precise areas Cabru targeted would be lethal to a human, yet seemed ineffectual on a sibling, suggesting a unique anatomical structure. Lyos meticulously documented these observations, earning Cabra's admiration for his extensive monster knowledge. Lyos's deductions about Farlin's respiratory ease despite a throat wound impressed Cabra, who praised Lyos's intellect as his key asset. Reflecting on Lyos's vow to conquer the dungeon master, Cabra acknowledged Lyos's unparalleled combination of knowledge and determination as potentially pivotal for success. He speculated on the aftermath of defeating the dungeon master questioning whether Lyos would assume control and how he would manage the city and its monsters, pondering if Lyos intended to seal it. In a change of subject, Lyos inquired about Cabru's hunger, anticipating his recent resurrection had left him famished. Assembling the group, Lyos sought Sinchi's assistance, not for rice but for the harpy eggs he had collected. Demonstrating his culinary skills, Lyos whipped up an omelette from a harpy egg, offering it to Cabru. He explained the origin of the eggs, suggesting Cabru try it given his apparent fascination with consuming monsters. Cabru was taken aback, wrestling with the notion of eating it or contemplating drastic measures to avoid the situation. Despite his apprehension, Cabru shakily accepted the chopsticks, his action unsurprising to his companions who knew of his willingness to earn trust. Tate enjoyed his ample rice serving, while Lin noticed Cabru's discomfort advising him to swallow the omelette he hesitated to consume. Maizuru finalized the teleportation spell, meticulously verifying that no one was injured since death after their return to the surface would render resurrection impossible. Soro candidly shared with Lyos his skepticism about Lyos surviving the journey to confront the mad sorcerer, suggesting death might come from food poisoning or another cause before that confrontation. He mentioned that should they succeed against the odds without a way back, Lyos should ring the bell he provided. Soro assured him a servant would then rescue them. Bidding his friend farewell, he implored Lyos to stay alive, for which Lyos expressed gratitude. Cabru, shaking Lyos's hand, reflected joyfully on their discussions, marking them as the pinnacle of his dungeon expedition. He queried Lyos about remembering his name, to which Lyos confidently affirmed, pleasing Cabru who requested his name be remembered until their paths crossed again. As the spell concluded, Lyos contemplated Cabra's hint at a return. Chilchik expressed his frustration over their unchanging location, while Marcel, laden with regret, apologized to the team. Lyos, however, encouraged his team, asserting their preparedness for forthcoming challenges. Like and subscribe for more.